All right, welcome everyone to the Myron Minar Seminar Series. I'm very pleased to um, join you today. My name is Nura Lori. I'm an assistant professor of international relations at Boston University. Um, I am on the committee along with uh, a couple of folks who, who are I, I see on Zoom, Anna Hardman. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our newest speaker, the latest speaker in our series. Um, Justin Guest, who is an associate professor of policy and government at George Mason, Mason University's Char School of Policy and Government. He studies immigration and politics of democratic, uh, demographic change and is the author of not one or two, but six books, um, a part alienated and engaged Muslims in the world that came out with Oxford University Press in 2010, the new minority white working class um, politics in the age of immigration and inequality that also came out with Oxford in 2016, the white working class, what everyone needs to know, Oxford again, 2018, Crossroads, a comparative immigration regimes in a world of demographic change, which was co-authored with Anna Boucher, um, and that came out in uh, by Cambridge in 2018. A textbook, Mass Appeal, Communicating Policy Ideas and Multiple Media, which came out with Oxford in 2020. And the most recent book, which he's going to be talking about today, which is called Majority Minority, that came out with Oxford University Press in 22. So um, I'm delighted to, to welcome him to the seminar, and I'll just hand over the floor. Thank you so much, Nura, and uh, and thank you to you guys for, for attending in person, and thanks to everyone who's joining us uh, via the internet. Um, it's it's great to be here, and, and, and I appreciate you guys welcoming me. Um, and uh, and I should note up front uh, just how critical Nura was actually to the creation of this book, uh, because uh, she was really, uh, gave really important advice along the way, and I consulted her regularly. And so, um, you know, I always say that much each of these books, I, I sort of stand on the shoulders of, of others um, uh, who give count, countless uh, uh, little pieces and tidbits of advice along the way. Uh, and I remain really, really grateful. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's talk about the book. Um, so my plan today uh, was not to get into uh, an enormous amount of technical detail, but to really just give a broad overview and sort of highlights of the book. Um, and if anyone wants to uh, double click on anything and, and ask questions, um, after I'm done, you just let me know because uh, a lot of it's gonna be very brief uh, going through the book, but trying to demonstrate the richness and the breadth of it. Um, uh, and then I love talking about the case studies and uh, we can go into greater depth then. Um, so this book uh, uh, is, is really asking um, uh, or responding, I should say, uh, to a, a pretty um, small uh, uh, census report. So in March, 2015, uh, the US Census Bureau um, produced a report. They, they produce these reports like almost weekly. There's always like a census study on something. And usually the only people who actually focus on these things or actually read them are uh, economists or demographers or geeks like us, right? Mm -hmm. And no one really pays much attention to these things. But in March, 2015, one of these reports was released and buried in the fourth paragraph um, was this little note that said, oh, by the way, in 2044, more than half of all Americans are projected to belong to a minority group any group other than non-Hispanic white alone. And this little line in this otherwise esoteric and, and unknown report um, was seized upon and it, it went effectively viral. Um, there were headlines from every major news outlet in the country, which of course um, went global as well. Sabina, my clicker is not, uh, I'm gonna go full screen. There we go, awesome. So any every major, you know, publication in the country and eventually the world um, began covering this, you know, that we're pointing to a majority minority nation, some more even hyperbolic or, or, or grave uh, demographic trends spell the end of the white majority in 2044. And of course, this also then spurred political parties and movements to respond accordingly. And on the left, it was largely uh, uh, greeted with eager anticipation um, and, and almost invigoration of the expansion of one of their primary constituencies, um, the disproportionate number of minority um, uh, groups that support the Democratic Party in particular. And it was also, they were also excited about the sort of natural evolution of a diversifying democracy. On the right, from their perspective, it was greeted with a lot of anxiety and discomfort about demographic change, um, not necessarily just about cultural threat, but also a sense of political threat that was associated um, with the altering status and the altering complexion of a nation. And you know, both sides were, were pro probably uh, a bit premature in their reactions. This is a bit hyperbolic. 
um, because demographic change is a process um, that is slow progressing, but also doesn't necessarily mean and entail the changes of power and, and power dynamics in a country. Uh, it also uh, relies upon conventional and established understandings of boundaries, which also change over time. And we'll talk more about that over the course of the presentation. Um, but everyone was scrambling to understand, well, what happens when a society faces this? And most of it, uh, most of the best research on this comes from the world of political psychology. Uh, and we're, we're joined, for those of you on Zoom who don't know this, we're joined by Ariel White, who actually is, I think, very important uh, thinker on, on these kinds of subjects. And as she will know, what we know about this uh, is largely at the individual level, that people respond to demographic change often by higher rates of intolerance and tribalism. Um, we know that when people are suddenly alerted to the growth of an outgroup, that they tend to be more defensive and territorial in their responses. Um, we also know that when you accuse, uh, acutely uh, expose people um, to the growth of other people uh, in outgroups, that their exclusionary attitudes tend to elevate. And all of this is made all the more grave because what psychologists and, and, and political psychologists have also found is that attitudes about minority groups, about identity, about migration are really hard to change. They are rigid. And that means it's very challenging to persuade people to think otherwise. They're effectively hardwired. So um, the challenge, of course, uh, with all of this is that these are all individual reactions. Um, what we did not know a whole lot about is what happens to society from a societal perspective. And the, in these individual studies, the individuals are studied usually after like, you know, a 30 second exposure to something. And then we follow them for maybe, you know, uh, their immediate reaction. Maybe we look for decay effects over 10 days or 30 days. Um, but ultimately, demographic change doesn't take 30 days, right? At maximum, right? It takes maybe 30 years, it may even take 60 years to take place, sometimes a century. And so to really understand how societies and governments respond to demographic change, we really have to take a more historical perspective. And that's what you'll see we'll do in, in, in this book and in this presentation. So what I'm going to try to answer over the course of the next 35 minutes is a few key questions. First, in the course of majority-minority milestones, how do societies pivot towards conflict or coexistence? So I'm going to take us on a, on a brief tour of a variety of other societies that have actually experienced an immigration-driven majority-minority milestone, much in the way the United States is expected to do so. Second, if nativism and nationalism are persistent, which I find that they are across all, st all studies, how are these things overcome? How do we navigate that nativism? How do we navigate prejudice in the face of these demographic milestones? And then finally, at the very end, because I'm at a policy school, I can't help myself, we'll talk about the implications of these findings for diverse democracies. Because ultimately, um, even though the United States is far ahead of an Australia or an or a Canada or a Belgium or a Britain or a France in its demography and its demographic evolution, those countries are not expecting a majority minority milestone anytime soon, if ever, in some cases. Their nationalism, the nativism, the backlash is really similar. And so if we can understand something about majority minority milestones in other societies, including the United States, we also may be able to better anticipate the politics elsewhere. So let's just move to the map. Um, I had to scour recent, I guess, modern global, global history to identify where we have an immigration induced majority minority milestone. And I found about 12 cases that satisfy the, that criteria over the course of the last 200 years. And I focus in the book on six such cases. They all happen to be islands. It was not deliberate. If you think about why they might be islands, mm -hmm. islands are accessible from all sides. Um, they are often ports and commercial spaces that bring a lot of different people into, into contact with another. They're also smaller islands, which means that their demographies are fragile, which means they can change very easily with the influx of one or more groups. So the first one I focus on is the case of Singapore. So Singapore is, a, is an island city-state at the tip of the Malaya Peninsula in Southeast Asia. And Singapore um, is an interesting uh, 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 way of a path towards being a majority-minority society. Um, it had historically been a Chinese-dominant city in an otherwise Malay state. Uh, and that's true during colonialism and thereafter uh, in, during independence. Um, they were always a part of greater Malaysia, effectively. Um, the way you know, Los Angeles is heavily Latino, but is part of an, a, a country that does not see itself as Latin. Um, Singapore saw itself the same way until 1965, when a mutual divorce between the Singaporeans and the Malay Federation led Singapore to secede and, and create its own sovereign country. At that moment, this Chinese dominant city 
became a Chinese dominant country that also managed its own immigration policy. And since then, the Singaporean government under the PAP has governed immigration in such a way that they have effectively frozen its demographic distribution precisely in the way it was in 1965. So the country for the last 50 years has been 73% Chinese, 14% Malay, 8% of Indian origin, which are mostly Tamils, and then a very smattering of, of people they call Eurasian or other. And that those numbers are not only the national demography and demographic distribution, they are replicated in the gerrymandering of electoral districts. Every district is precisely the same distribution of 73, 14, 8. And every public housing building is also distributed that way. So you have ethnic quotas in every Singaporean institution effectively. They also have created separate social service providers for each of the different groups under the C, M, I, and O headings, Chinese, Malay, Indian, other. And schools are segregated in these kinds of ways as well. Um, a society that is basically built upon racial boundaries. However, the Singaporean government has also worked very hard to cross the boundaries that they themselves reinforce. It is a paradox wrapped in an enigma. The second case is uh, Noor's home country, actually, of Bahrain. So Bahrain, this island uh, just squeezed between Qatar and, and, the, and the Saudi mainland there uh, of the peninsula, um, is majority minority in, in potentially two ways. And that's what makes it so fascinating. In the more conventional way, 57% of its population is of foreign origin. They're born in another country. And that's something that we see elsewhere in the Gulf, right? So the UAE and Qatar, actually 90%, uh, more or less, it's estimated. Kuwait is also quite high, around 70% uh, foreign born. Um, but almost none of these people who are foreign born have access to any significant social rights, political rights, um, welfare programs, or any subsidies. Um, they are effectively second class in uh, the, these different societies. And so it's not the same as a majority minority milestone because they simply don't share status the way a minority might otherwise do so. What makes Bahrain so fascinating, however, is that beginning in the year around 2000, 2001, um, uh, and I should mention uh, before we even say uh, what happened in 2000, 2001, this is a country that has historically been uh, majority Shia. Um, we, we don't know exactly what the majority Shia looks like and has looked like over the last 80 years because censuses are forbidden and have not been undertaken by the state or anyone else, um, but it has been ruled by a Sunni royal court, uh, the Al-Khalifa family. And beginning in around 2000, there is a not so well secret, uh, uh, well kept secret uh, campaign to strategically naturalize uh, a, a large amount of Sunni Arabs coming from other uh, regional states. So uh, Egypt, Yemen, Saudi, um, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, and elsewhere to work in the security forces and the police of the country, um, which has had the probably intentional effect of altering the demographic balance between Shia and Sunni. Again, we do not know how much. So for all we know, maybe Bahrain is majority Sunni now, but we will never know because censuses are forbidden. And the last person who attempted to actually take one has now been banned from the country and is living in Qatar. So we, it's a fascinating place in these dual ways of, of demographic politics. The third case is in the Western Indian Ocean, and that's Mauritius. Um, Mauritius was uninhabited until the 16th century when Dutch colonizers brought Malagasy slaves to establish a sugar plantation economy. Um, the Dutch eventually abandoned it. They couldn't make it work. The formerly enslaved Malagasy's um, then basically had the island to themselves as, as, as freemen. However, um, it eventually became recolonized by the French and then later transferred to the British uh, as a classic kind of a sugar colony, um, slave-based economy. Um, however, in 1831, the British abolished slavery across its dominions, and Mauritius became the site of what was then called the Great Experiment. And the Great Experiment was the introduction of indentured servitude, where you continue to have free labor, but at the end of a five-year indenture, the workers were granted a small parcel of arable land. And that's exactly what happened. And what the, the people that they imported primarily came from South Asia, principally India. And within 30 years, from 1831 to 1861, um, the Indo-Mauritian population outnumbered the African Creole natives. And so the people who had been freed to occupy this country um, barely actually even had this time to actually uh, settle there before they were outnumbered. Um, and then, of course, later in its history, um, the Indo-Mauritian population significantly outnumbered them. To this day, all politics, even post-independence, is completely racialized. Every party is divided by race and, and religion. 
The fourth case is in the East Caribbean. It's Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Trinidad and Tobago has a very similar history, actually, to, um, to Mauritius. Uh, sugar plantation economy um, eventually uh, relied heavily on indentured servants. The difference, however, is that um, the Indian origin population in Trinidad did not actually come to outnumber the Afro-Trinidadian population uh, until 1995. It took a much longer period. And for the 30 years post-independence before that, the country was ruled by its principal Afro-origin party, the PNM. And in 1995, it was the, not only the moment when these two groups became about equal in number in the country and share, but also at the moment, uh, at that moment uh, when they elected their first ever Indian origin prime minister, Basdio Pandi. Pandi himself was a socialist and he actually was like to fancy himself as race blind. I interviewed him for the chapter, um, but he basically had no choice but to get wrapped up into its identity politics and actually probably did more harm uh, than good in actually fanning the flames of these politics. And to this day, their, their political parties are completely racialized. UNM is principally uh, 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 African um, uh, origin, and the, uh, and sorry, the PNM is, is principally Afro origin, and the UNC is principally Indo origin. And every trivial political matter is a proxy war, a proxy fight in a grander culture war. A little reminiscent of our own country. Um, which brings me to the fifth case. So this is a bit cheeky. Uh, it's the case of New York. Now, New York, of course, is not a sovereign country, but if anyone's visited New York, you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise. <laughs> it is, uh, they're quite sovereign sounding. Um, however, up until 1882, all US states actually had sovereign control over immigration, admission and deportation into their states. In fact, Massachusetts, where we stand right now, unless you're on Zoom, you, uh, you were actually the, the greatest deporters in the country. Uh, they deported more Irish people from Massachusetts uh, than any other state uh, deported immigrants. And I know that sounds ironic given what we know about uh, uh, Massachusetts today, but that is, it is the truth. And New York was, 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 was no different in its receipt of immigrants. It admitted an enormous number of immigrants, particularly during the Great Famine in Ireland between 1845 and 1854. Sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I'm curious how many Irish deported from New York. From New York, yeah. uh, like deportations. Yeah. So I don't know off the top of my head, but there's an amazing book about this by um, uh, uh, Hide, Hidetaka Hirota, uh, who's a Japanese uh, uh, origin American historian. Uh, so, he, uh, and he just uh, began a new job at Berkeley and he wrote a fantastic book actually about this. Uh, and he will have all details exactly of how many people they did. And that's actually where the history came from. And that's actually what inspired me to study New York in the first place. Yeah, because I didn't know these things either at, uh, going into this book. So New York, when it received all these Irish people, it, it wasn't just a small influx. This was more people during that 10 years than all American immigrants combined since independence. So this was an enormous influx of people and it really uh, threw New York for a loop. Um, New Yorkers discriminated and excluded the Irish. They castigated them as, as dependent and, and destitute and drunken and criminal. And they were excluded from a lot of major social and, and economic institutions such that the Irish responded by creating not only their own Catholic churches, but also Catholic institutions more broadly like universities, Catholic and University of America, Fordham, Boston College across the river. Um, and also Catholic uh, hospitals and orphanages and charities in order to protect themselves. And they also did so in the political manner too, by creating blocks with the Democratic Party to flex their muscle, their popular muscle. And this set a model for American immigrants thereafter, because soon after came Catholic Italians, Germans, Jews, Greeks, Slavs, all of whom um, followed this model minority and how they were able to actually protect themselves from discrimination thereafter. The final case is another U.S. state, but it really was, ne it was never such. So Hawaii was actually uh, a kingdom, a monarchy that was completely sovereign until the U.S. forcibly annexed it in 1898 um, from the Kamehameha dynasty. And until that period, the Kamehameha uh, dynasty had ruled for about 100 years after consolidating power on the islands after first Western contact. And during that period, um, they began to cooperate with missionaries and Western planters to create a sugar economy, a whaling economy, pineapples as well. But they needed uh, uh, labor to man these fields and to man these industries. And Native Hawaiians either did not want to work in, in, in such grueling labor in, in a capitalist economy uh, or feudalistic economy, 
Um, and in many cases, there just weren't enough of them. They were decimated by smallpox and other diseases after Western contact, and they needed more people. So the monarchy um, willingly, voluntarily sought out what they called kindred races and imported large numbers of people from Japan, China, and also the Philippines to man these fields and these industries. And by 1890, shortly before they were um, uh, taken by the United States uh, in that forcible, you know, largely bloodless coup, uh, they became a majority minority country. But unlike a lot of other countries, Hawaiians possessed a lot of cultural and conceptual resources that actually extended an understanding of guardianship over their land to foreigners. They were not, while, while they certainly were nationalistic in some senses and, and the monarchy responded to nativism um, in a variety of ways, um, they had the sort of vernacular to extend some sense of identification to redefine what it meant to be Kanaka, what it meant to be a, a native Hawaiian. And it's an interesting case to follow. So what do we learn from these six cases? And forgive the brevity of these vignettes, but I, we have a lot to get through and feel free to ask any questions about these in the Q&A. But what we learn is that there's a pretty consistent path of majority minority societies. And they begin with the um, industrialization of the British empire. That created a voracious appetite for labor, which gets moved in. And in all of these countries, we also see them uh, segregating the people who they bring in, uh, both to control them and to prevent organization and to segment the labor market as well. So it wasn't just residential segregation, but the segmentation of the labor market as well. Where they begin to diverge is really as relates to the extension of enfranchisement and equality, whether you treat the minority group as you treat the majority group um, or minority groups in some cases. And this is where some of the cases differ. And they also differ as it relates to the reconstruction of identity. While some of these nations um, completely redefined who they were to extend and include the minority groups, others became very exclusive and tried to protect the in-group's advantages and power in a variety of ways. Independently of what happens, they all undertake, uh, undergo um, and endure a lot of political backlash. Prejudice, racism, nativism is basically the turf upon which uh, this history proceeds. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is in every single case that I study. So there is no case where we don't see this. And in some ways, maybe that should feel, like us feel a little bit better in the United States that you know, it's par for the course to experience the kind of um, prejudice and discrimination that is arising under these demographic pressures. But in any case, um, that is what the historical record shows too. But all of these countries have also tried to exert control over the uncontrollable. So when backlash arose against these demographic distributional shifts, um, states tried to control dem demography, which is very hard to control. It's hard to control how many children people have and who gets to have those children. It's hard to control when people die. It's hard to control who people marry. That hasn't stopped states from trying, though. And what they do is address the three key questions, I think. One is who comes, who counts, and the third is who connects. What these refer to is who comes is, is, a, is, is a, a matter of immigration, the number of people you bring in and the attributes of those people. So you think about the Singaporean case, literally selecting people on race or ethnicity, you also can try to cut off immigration completely. So number and attributes, selection, deportation, and also whether you give immigrants temporary or permanent residence. Uh, remember Bahrain, everyone is on a two-year visa. It's, it's renewable like a driver's license. It's very easy, but ultimately it's contingent. Who counts refers to power. It's the distribution of electoral power by managing who is eligible to vote, by gerrymandering districts to disempower some groups over others, and to literally determine who counts by a census, right? Who actually counts? And we've seen these politics in the United States, of course, already. And who connects refers to contact, the extent of intergroup interaction through residential segregation, labor market segmentation, and the creation of group-specific institutions rather than universal ones. But what we also want to focus on, I think, are the institutional differences between these different places and how they actually move to an inclusive or an exclusive approach to identity creation. And there are five key pivot areas over the course of history where states make institutional decisions to include or exclude minority groups and newcomers. The first relates to ideology. And ideology is a shorthand way of really asking or answering the question of, who are we? as a country, every nation must do so. And that definition can be universalist and inclusive in nature, or it can be based on a sense of superiority of one group over others. And when it's universalist, 
You see intermarriage. You may see labor or socialism that tries to cross boundaries. You see the leveraging of, of religion to unite people as, as all the same under God. And when it's superior, there's usually residential segregation, racial hierarchies, the use of religion to divide, all under the logics of some groups' supremacy over others. And not necessarily white supremacy. We see the logic of supremacy independent of the race of the majority group. The second pivot when, and the space to watch, in many ways, these are sort of spaces to watch in other diversifying democracies, um, is education. And this refers to the socialization of youth. Are young people socialized in an inclusive way or an exclusive way, often in schools? Are schools integrated? Are they learning all the same language or are they, are, are they separate? Um, when you conscribe people into the military or to national service, is it universal or is it uh, selective? Um, do textbooks recognize the contributions of minority groups to a nation's formation and history? Similarly, on the other side, or I should say inversely on the other side, is language uh, taught, different languages taught to different people? Uh, are schools segregated? Uh, is conscription into national service selective in our textbooks ignoring those contributions? The third pivot relates to culture. And this is about whether you have an inclusive uh, or leveraging inclusive or exclusive national cultural attributes. Inclusivity is pretty simple. There's lots of arts and, and film and music and cuisine and literature, all of which are sort of hybridized in spaces. And a government can leverage these collaborations and hybridity and fusion in order to defy political boundaries or social boundaries that divide. On the exclusive side, though, you, you know, governments can invoke the politics of memory or truth, engage in historical disputes, um, uh, the politics of tradition. Um, here in the United States, you see art working divisively sometimes, like public art and, and the controversies over um, Confederate statues, for instance, uh, or in sports with the uh, uh, certain football players kneeling during the national anthem. The fourth pivot relates to commerce. So you can have an inclusive or an exclusive market experience. When it's inclusive, markets are spaces of interdependency and states can facilitate lower inequality and, and even redistribution of wealth. Where they're divisive and exclusive, you have labor market segmentation, you have racialized poverty, and you have the divisive politics of reparation. And then finally, the politics of threat. When you have an external concept of threat to the nation, it's often very unifying on the inside. But many people actually perceive the greatest threat to be from the opposing political party or an opposing minority group. And that's when it becomes very divisive. So it's external usually when there's a threat of war or encroachment by another nation. And it's internal when you have racialized partisanship, census politics, and gerrymandering. Now, up until now, I've been focusing a lot on institutions and, in, and, and the way that states monitor and govern these spaces. And these are the spaces that I say we should be watching as America diversifies into the future, um, the politics of threat and national ideology, culture, commerce, and education. But it's also worth thinking about other ways um, that states have deal, dealt with these things, both for good and bad. So even, I, I, then here's where I pivot to the, the second question I mentioned earlier. Even with pivots to coexistence, how do we overcome nativism and nationalism? And what we have seen up until now uh, is, is the institutions, but what I also find across the case studies is the enormous power of rhetoric, because rhetoric and identity politics in general is actually really cheap. And we see this because identities are drawn by elites that assign labels to different groups, and these labels get reinforced then by institutions thereafter. But I just think about you know, my, my earlier work on white working class politics and the appeal that Donald Trump had, right? Here you have this plutocratic millionaire, billionaire, we're not really sure how much money he's worth, um, probably less now, I'm not sure. In any case, here he was appealing to my white working class subjects, um, but how did he do it? He didn't create policies that actually helped uh, materially or, or, or even uh, uh, socially the, 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 the subjects, right? What he did was actually leverage rhetoric to make people feel a sense of status and recognition, right? He once got on a, on a podium and said, I love poorly educated people. He said that in Nevada during the 2016 campaign, right? And this had a, a, a resonance with white working class people that was really powerful. We see this across the case studies as well. Powerful elite leaders have the ability to define boundaries in the ways they wish. And so what I wanted to do was uh, test this in the contemporary moment. How do we leverage the lessons of these historical approaches today? So I, I, I organized two survey experience, experiments um, with my co-author, Tyler Rennie. And these test the power of leveraging nationalism as a logic for accepting immigration, for actually tolerating demographic change rather than rejecting it. 
And the other one uh, tries to leverage trusted interlocutors, leveraging co-identity uh, in order to persuade people that immigration is gonna be okay. So let's just go into these um, before we conclude. So the first experiment takes place in Europe. Um, it's a survey across 19 European countries, about 22,000 adults, um, representative samples in each of the different countries. So we can actually speak at the national level uh, with some degree of confidence and power. Um, and in all of these countries, members of the far right or followers of the far right hold inflated estimates of these foreign born. Many of them think that a majority minority uh, milestone is approaching, even though of course it's nowhere near. Um, also, we see um, the far right occupying space in parliaments now. In some, of the, in some of these countries, they're actually in the prime ministership and the premiership. So we ask, what if immigration was key to the national survival rather than its greatest threat? So we expose a treatment group across these different countries um, to the following fake news article. Now, the article is fake, but the information is real. So all of these articles are adapted for the local country. So this is in English and it's, and it's for British and it's British data. But in Italy, they read it in Italian and it was Italian data. And in France, it was French data in, in, in French. The key though, is this line in, in yellow wash um, that we are framing demographic change as a necessity and critical to the maintenance, the sustainability of the national population of the nation itself. Have a read and then we'll come back to discuss it. Now, in case you're watching this on your phone and the screen is too small to actually see, this is just describing the way that your country, whichever country the subject is reading it from, is going to be dependent on immigration to sustain the nation. But it's also a pretty hard test. If you made it down to the last sentence, it's a hard test because we're also overt and honest about where future immigrants will come from. And it's principally the sort of outgroups of Europe, the boogeymen of the far right, and that is uh, African countries and Muslim majority states. So we're very honest about this, making it a pretty hard test to persuade. Now, a natural critique of this kind of approach is, okay, but this is you know, occupying space in the absence of a rhetorical environment where the far right is leveraging replacement theory to actually dash all of this and say, no, these are not actually the opportunity for survival. They're our greatest threat to our existence. And so what we did is we split the treatment group into another group that actually saw a far right rejoinder. That group here saw a, a quote from a politician, and we said it was a British politician, and of course in Italy it was an Italian politician, um, but the quote is real. I'll let you have a quick read. Does anyone know who the quote's from? The Grand Master of Great Replacement himself, Viktor Orban, the mm. Prime Minister of Hungary. So we just use his quote and we say it across the different countries. So we are exposing people to Great Replacement logic to see what it does to any effects that may come from the paragraphs above. So the general results look like this um, in text form. So the nudges move uh, European attitudes 0.10 points on a five point scale of immigration policy liberalism. So it liberalizes people's views on this five point scale marginally, but statistically significantly uh, across the aggregate uh, of, all these play of all these countries. 0.14 points, a little bit more in Western Europe and a, and a double of the, the average in Ch the Czech Republic, Denmark and Britain, all of which by the way are countries that have very strong far right movements, right? Britain just left the union. And of course, Denmark has just cracked down on refugees and generosity of the welfare state. The Czech Republic just recently had a far right government. So this is relatively impressive given that it's just a short two paragraph intervention. Um, the survey was run in 2020 during the pandemic, and so we used attention checks to make sure that people were actually following along because two paragraphs is a lot to ask survey respondents to read. Limiting only to those passing the attention checks, um, the amp this amplifies the effects across the entire continent, and it grows significantly large, up to even a 0.30 effect in Denmark and Spain. Um, again, Denmark is quite a, a, a backlashy country when it comes to immigration recently. But the real question is, how do they respond to this far-right rejoinder in my mind? Because these paragraphs are so cheap and, and ephemeral. 
And what we find is pretty fascinating. The Western European effect actually grows ever so slightly after it be experiencing the far right rejoinder, but the effect completely disappears in Eastern Europe. And the question why we don't, we can't actually uh, uh, analyze or even answer uh, with any kind of authority, but our hunch is that it relates to two things. One, and I think most importantly, Eastern Europe just doesn't have very much immigration, right? They're primarily countries of emigration and departure, but also there are places that have a lot of far-right politicians where great replacement theory might actually resonate better and, and, and feel familiar, and it completely disappears the effect. Um, still, we are encouraged by the effect in Western European countries, countries that are diversifying, and I think that it's an indication of what leveraging nationalist terms can do to actually per se, persuade immigration skeptics. Of course, we know that language choice, message framing, they're basically, we know that they have a limited effect. And it's not the kind of thing that you can organize an entire movement around, at least, at least it takes time to do so. And we also know that people are subject to motivated reasoning. So we wanted to also explore another technique that we saw across the historical cases where you use trusted interlocutors to try to persuade people. And this is something that political psychologists have actually been exploring. What happens when you engage trusted people who are leaders that people co-identify with, whether it's on gender basis, race, religion, ideology? We know that actually it does move people on other subjects, but we don't know whether it moves people on hardwired subjects like race, immigration, ethnicity, religion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of evidence that suggests that these views are very hard to persuade. And so we apply this here in the United States we ask, what would happen if Republicans in the United States were receiving pro-immigration messages from other Republican in-group elites? So the first thing we needed to do, of course, was find out who are the most liked and trusted Republican elites. And so we ran a pilot survey that, that literally just quizzed Republicans on like 40 different really popular, who we thought would be very popular people. And what we found, we did not include Donald Trump for reasons that I'll explain in a second. So other than Trump, who are the most popular Republicans in the United States? Mike Pence, the former vice president, um, the Reverend uh, Franklin Graham, uh, former football quarterback Peyton Manning, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon. These are some of the more popular, well-liked, and well-trusted Republicans. Um, there are a couple other Republican politicians. Remember, this was done in 20. 19, I think, or 2020. And so it's before the sort of star of Tucker Carlson has risen and before a variety of other politicians' uh, stars rose. Um, and we only limited it to white men because we wanted to make sure that we are co-identifying beyond just an ideology, but also on race and gender. And we know that the Republican Party is disproportionately white and male. However, setting all these gentlemen aside, they were not nearly as popular as one person, and that is Sean Hannity. Yeah. Sean Hannity, the Fox News commentator, was the most popular, the most liked, the most trusted person at the time. And of course, we wanted to leverage him, but I was not going to persuade Sean to suddenly help us with the social science project to persuade people that immigration is a good thing. So we hired a professional voice actor to impersonate him. <laughs> so you've heard of a, a deep fake where AI generated video creates uh, audio and video to persuade people that, uh, of, of a fake uh, monologue. We didn't have a budget for, uh, for a, a deep fake, so this is a shallow fake. So our subjects saw the following. There should be audio. I fought against open borders and illegals. Come to realize that Congress gridlock on immigration simply amounted to anyway. So I want to underscore um, uh, one thing. At the very beginning of his monologue, he begins with three sentences. I'm a conservative Republican. I have been my whole life, and I'm worried about the way our country governs immigration, right? That is the co-identity. That is the source of the co-identity besides the visual right, appearance and the Republican label. And we split the treatment group into those that heard that co-identity prime and those who only heard what followed after it. Now, before I show you the results and the effects, you're probably also thinking to yourself, this is really cute, but you're not gonna get Sean Hannity to come to your side. So what impact does this tell us? What practical use is this kind of experiment? I'd say you're right. 
He has a, he's a celebrity. He's probably not going to come onto our, our side. By the way, I should note in 2013, 2014, he actually was very pro comprehensive immigration reform. So he's actually flipped uh, over the years with the rise of Trump and the, and the new Republican party. Um, who knows what Fox News commentators believe, right, in their hearts, because as we've seen, they don't actually speak from their hearts. So in any case, he's not coming to the side of embracing demographic change. So what we wanted to do was to create another Republican elite who we were confident no one has ever heard of, with the understanding that if that Republican elite, the anonymous Republican elite, is effective, then any old elite would probably do. So what we did is we created someone named John Wagner. I'm gonna introduce you to him in a second. Wagner, we told our subjects, is the chairman of the Republican party. Now, for those of you who are politicos, you know that he is not the chairman. It's actually a chairwoman and it's Ronna Romney McDaniel, but almost no one knows who the chairman of the Republican party is. And so we told people that John Wagner is the chairman and that he gave a speech to uh, a Republican a group of Republicans. And we used the voiceover from Mike Pence because we knew that was a voice that people were familiar with and trusted. Um, and as you'll see, I actually think that Mike Pence's impression is better than the Hannity impression even. So have a listen. You'll see that the text is exactly the same. So in case you're wondering, the rhetoric after the co-identity prime, this treatment group was also split uh, between those who heard the co-identity prime and who didn't. The rhetoric afterwards is stolen shamelessly directly from John McCain. So it's literally from John McCain's speeches in the 2008 campaign. So we're not creating something that Republicans should say. We're creating, we're using things that Republicans did say uh, to make it all that more realistic and also replicable. Um, so this is exactly what subjects saw. Yesterday, Blank spoke at a meeting of Republican Party officials and volunteers. Click the video on the next page to listen and they heard what you saw. And just to underscore, this is the part that was um, uh, subject to, a, uh, to two different treatment groups. Um, what we find I think is really interesting. So the nudges move people in a more liberal direction from both gentlemen, um, in a more liberal direction on a 100 point scale of, of immigration liberalism. Um, it really, we ask a, a, a sort of index of questions about legalizing a pathway of legalization for undocumented people. Uh, we ask about uh, extension of public benefits to immigrants, job training programs, Hispanic Heritage Month, um, a variety of sort of policy, a suite of policy moves that you might see a government take and that are controversial. And this, these notes just move people um, meaningfully and statistically significantly um, to the more liberal direction. But what's fascinating is they do not work unless the co-identity prime is present. And it shows the power of that identity prime uh, in a controlled environment. The other thing that's fascinating is that Hannity moves attitudes marginally, but not as much as Wagner. And we don't exactly know why, because obviously Wagner doesn't exist. Um, he's completely fictitious, but, but Wagner doesn't possess the baggage of a real person. And so we suspect that the less you know about someone, maybe the more persuasive they can even be. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting nonetheless. So, you know, if anyone was worried, okay, you can't get Hannity, but Wagner's a drop off, quite the opposite. Wagner was actually more persuasive. Finally, we also observe no reputational effects. So we ask people before and after their impressions of the speakers. And we find that actually the, in, 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 I'm not sure if it was statistically significant, but it actually improved their reputation to see them take this counter stereotypical view on immigration. So we saw no detrimental uh, reputational effects by basically um, slaying the sacred cow of Republican Party right now. Now, of course, naturally, this is not uh, an artificial environment, right? Donald Trump is not going on truth social to condemn Sean Hannity for what he just said or John Wagner. But it's interesting that in the abstract, people are not inclined to hate this person for going back on this Republican talking point. Okay, so what does all this tell us? Um, I think it shows us the power of meeting people where they are. 
So up until now, the immigrant rights movement in the United States in particular has been focusing on how can we ameliorate the image of immigrants? How can we show people how they take jobs that no one wants? They fill labor gaps. Uh, they, they have skills that we really need in this country. They innovate, they invest, they create jobs. Uh, they are humanitarian cases that deserve charity and are and a source of vulnerability for the country. They're part of the nation's history. We're constantly trying to improve the image of immigrants. What this research showed, and by the way, that has been effective at moving public opinion in a liberal direction over the course of the last 30 years, but it has hit a wall. We are basically at the point where um, the Republican Party and those are, and its followers are completely against immigration. And you have a situation where Republicans are threatened by it to the point that immigration remains a top three issue for most Republicans today. So what we see here is that the power of this to move immigration skeptics comes not from trying to intervene or persuade people about the value of immigrants, but to actually persuade people about the nationalist argument for why you need them. We use credible messengers, not someone foreign preaching to them or instructing them or teaching them what to think. And we use messengers on nationalist terms. We are effectively going with the grain. What we also see here is that states and elites, whether through institutions or rhetoric, hold remarkable amount of power to overcome prejudice and nativism, to navigate the thorny politics of demographic change. And so we should, it is a very much an elite argument, an elitist argument in this book, that a lot of the power to actually navigate these thorny demographic politics comes from the top and that governments have a really big role to play. Um, but it also shows that the eradication of prejudice is not going to happen, at least not anytime soon. And so if we're going to navigate these politics, the prejudice, the current media environment, the algorithms, the political institutions that are so flawed in our country are basically the turf upon which progress must be made. What it requires ultimately from those elites is policy and strategy. And those are two things we really do not have in the United States. There is no stra national strategy for social cohesion and solidarity in the face of demographic shifts. Right? There is no House subcommittee for you know, demographic change. There is no Office of National Unity at the White House. There's no special assistant to the president on social cohesion. These things don't exist, but they do exist in Singapore. They do exist to a limited extent in Canada. There are countries that are preparing for the demographic shifts they expect um, or for the thorny politics of race in Singapore's case. So even though it's an autocracy, they're actually a model for how to actually concern yourself with these politics, even though they are the source of those politics themselves, it's a paradox. Um, however, what I will also add is the caveat. We cannot, I think, expect politicians to do this work. They are incentivized by short-term incentives of, of elections, and it leads them to divide societies in, in almost an entrepreneurial way in order to remain in office or get into office. And so I actually think that these policies and strategies could be equally pursued by associational life, by civil society, by businesses. And the way to do it is to basically take a sort of a, a, a sustainability approach. So 40 years ago, sustainability and, and, and climate change was kind of in a place where national unity and the politics of demographic change is today. It was nascent, there were no government institutions around it, but what was developed was a sense of a criteria for how to run an organization, right? We ask ourselves, do you have to print this sheet of paper, right? You know, what is, what is the effect that you're going to do on the, of your action on the environment? We ask these things all the time. We don't ask ourselves right now the following questions. Does our action reinforce or break down social boundaries between people? Um, how is, can our action strengthen the sense of connection between people and bring them together? And finally, after our action, will people trust the institution more or less? If organizations, governments, um, businesses, begin to ask these questions, they can actually be bridgers in the, across, these, across these divides, but right now no one is. And so to the extent that I'm an optimist, and many people accuse me of being one, it's because we haven't even tried to actually navigate these politics. Before anyone gets pessimistic, I want to underscore some American advantages. The United States is quite different, as if it weren't already obvious, from the cases that I study. We, and that's because we have certain advantages that they did not have. The first is that U.S. minorities are not of a single background, right? That's the most obvious statement in this presentation. We have hundreds of nationalities, hundreds of languages spoken, hundreds of religion, uh, religions and religious sects in the United States. And of course, those intersect 
in myriad ways. Second, immigration has remained continuous to the country and largely fallen. So unlike a lot of these other countries where you have the sudden influx of people into a state, the United States has not experienced that kind of thing um, really since the Great Famine. Third, minorities today reach every region country. They're now in the hinterland. Uh, they're not just in coastal cities. And mixed-race people, people intermarrying and, and having mixed-race children, have tripled since 2010, which is remarkable, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. But finally, and this is the point that I'll leave you with, with the United States actually has historical and institutional memory about majority-minority milestones because we've actually experienced one before. Whiteness in the United States was always limited until the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. It was limited to people who were of Northern European Protestant backgrounds. Through that lens, we've become a minority, major, a majority minority country as of like the 1920s, but it was hushed and it was ignored and evaded because whiteness was broadened to incorporate those white ethnics that we talked about who were previously excluded and discriminated against in New York and Boston and Philadelphia. Right, And that altered the boundaries of whiteness. How can we avoid doing that again? Because by expanding the boundaries of whiteness, we assimilated the white ethnic groups, but at the expense of people who were deemed not white enough and they, who can, whose subjugation continued. And then those days it meant African-Americans and Asiatics, as they were called then, Asian Americans. And today that includes Latinos as well. But we are on the verge of repeating these historical errors. Whiteness is beginning to expand again. 60% of US Latinos self-identify as white. And among those groups who are uh, of two or more races, um, about 60% or sorry, no, 70% have at least one white parent. So they are white adjacent. What we need to do is not broaden whiteness, but broaden the understanding of what it means to be an American. I'll leave it there. I'll put up some contact details. Feel free to be in touch. Uh, an optimistic to note. I appreciate that. Um, we have a couple of questions online. I also just want to see if um, people have questions in the audience here. Um, please, if you're online, um, keep posting questions. We're going to start with Jax. I also have some questions, but I will wait a little bit. Um, so Jack uh, said, um, okay, so I'm going to actually combine because he, he wrote again. Um, Thank you, Jack. Uh, Gordon, I thought you said the attitudes on immigration were hard to change. Um, so readers are reacting to this. So this was when you were presenting the experiments. Um, and then he just added, Canada accepts half a million immigrants each year. They have a minister of immigration, refugee, and citizenship. Is migration of partners an issue uh, there as it is in the U.S.? And 36% of Canadian physicians are born outside of Canada. How does this play politically? So yeah. maybe we can move those two questions. Yeah, they're great questions. So yes, Jack, you're right. Um, uh, immigration attitudes are hard to move, which is precisely why Tyler and I are, are impressed by the statistically significant effects that we observe. Mm -hmm. um, they are marginal. We're not revolutionizing. We're not changing minds hugely. Um, they're marginal effects. And, uh, but that is the sort of, uh, that is, the, the currency of social science, right, is what, what are the marginal effects. And the fact that these are statistically significant tell us that it's possible to nudge people in certain directions mm -hmm. and, you know, try to expand upon that in, in the future. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that knowing that these views are rigid actually makes us appreciate um, the magnitude of these effects uh, even more. Um, in terms of Canada, it's a great question, Jacques. I don't know if you're Canadian, um, but... Uh, uh, but it's 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 a it's a fascinating uh, issue there. Um, it is less of a partisan issue. I mean, both parties are scrambling in Canada to demonstrate how much they love multiculturalism. Um, you're starting to see a little bit of Trumpism uh, uh, in being infused into the Tories, um, and uh, you know th there was a Reform Party as well that uh, that is kind of trying to be unearthed, I guess, or has some future. But it it, it hasn't really stuck. Um, and it, it's kind of an off-limits issue. You have a ministry of multiculturalism, literally, uh, hence the, the, the idea of strategy. Um, so Canada is, is in some ways a paragon, uh, and they have made immigration um, a critical part of, it, of their country's nationality, of their national identity. Um, uh, the other question he asked uh, was about uh, 
Uh, uh, well, well, actually, that the you, physicians, yeah, yeah the, the physicians, physicians yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's just kind of part of uh, of what Canadians kind of come to expect that the immigrants bring um, benefits and, and are a critical part of the country. Great. So we have three more questions online, but I just want to, yeah, open it up to the floor here. Please go ahead. And... So uh, thanks, Justin. This has been fascinating, and also you covered quite a bit of ground. And so. Um, you know, I have a number of questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll just start with one. So, um, you know, so I was thinking about your case study, right? And they were, so first of all, they were fascinating, but then I was thinking about the selection and, and noticing that a lot of them were kind of autocracies or, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know enough about some of these cases, but none were like classic democracy uh, that we envision today where there's uh, their voters and their voting and immigrants might not yet vote uh, and then later they become a part of the like, people and so I wonder whether that influences the dynamic and kind of how states approach uh, this situation and decide to exert control because there's something about when um, you know the demographic changes people's voting base changes is something about when immigrants are outsiders and parties have to deal with it and the related question is you know I wonder if the party system has something to do with this because when we think about um, you know the majority minority divide it seems like it's particularly relevant for countries with two parties and uh, majority voting systems whereas in other countries with more proportional representation um, this majority minority divide is less politically um, problematic for some groups in power, and uh, particularly when immigration comes from different backgrounds, it might be more like group planning, they would just split both parties. So, the whole kind of political effect of this uh, demographic change is less, it does not necessarily happen in this like switch from majority. Yeah, no, these are excellent questions. Thanks, Mario. I, pre I appreciate it. Um, so with the autocracies question, only two are autocracies. Um, I mean, the, Hawaii was uh, an autocracy. It was a, a monarchy. So you could say three. Um, uh, Singapore in, is a competitive authoritarian state, if you will. Um, but the PAP always wins. Um, uh, and then Bahrain is a monarchy. So yes, these are, it's, a, it's a fair point to make. However, we see techniques used by these governments, tactics and strategies used by these governments that democratic states also use. Um, is there a world where a democratic state um, denies citizenship to people according to their race or ethnicity? No. So there are some things that are off limits or it would cease to be a democracy. So some things are kind of off limits, but it's amazing the amount of semi-authoritarian tactics that a lot of democratic states are using today, right? Um, you know, subtle or not so subtle um, uh, quota systems. Um, certainly Hungary and Poland have made it very clear that they have no interest in, in people who are of Islamic backgrounds. Uh, but when there were uh, Ukrainian refugees, they're like absolutely welcome these white Christians and Orthodox people over to our, into our, into our borders. So, you know, in, in some ways we think of autocracies and democracies totally different, but in the way that they govern um, immigration, we see so many similarities, you know? Um, so it, it I, I think there is a limited amount of, um, of, of actions that are truly off limits to democracies. And ultimately, what is the purpose of these cases? Um, are they predictive of the United States? No, but what they really are is sort of um, simulative of what the politics will be like and could, could be like, depending on the way that states act, I think. Um, so I, in the book, deliberately try not to put too much pressure on these case studies, um, uh, precisely because of you know, compar comparability issues. Um, but they do, but, but their diversity is also a virtue in some ways because it shows us the sort of range of ways that governments can respond. Um, the majoritarian voting is interesting too. So the politics of demographic change intensifies under majoritarian logics because that's where numbers matter, right? You can have a powerful minority in a country when numbers don't matter. It is harder to have a powerful minority when numbers do matter. And um, I think we see that across the cases. Um, however, to push back a little bit on the idea of multiple parties versus two party, in states that have two parties, it's, it's, it's problematic in the sense that um, you, know, you divide the country in, into these you know, simplistic ways. But actually, one party often becomes a big tent, right? And that's like Democrats in the United States, labor rights in Britain. Um, the liberals maybe in Canada. Um, 
because you only have two parties effectively, Canada has a third, um, but they haven't really won in a while. Um, so you, you create these bigger tents. When you have a proportional representation system on multi-party systems like Mauritius, for example, um, it may be more, more problematic because Mauritius has a, an, an, a, an Indian party that is only Hindu, an Indian party that is Muslim, and then they have a Catholic party that is predominantly Afro-Creole. And it is divided on these lines, which actually shrinks and prevents them from crossing boundaries the way a big tent might. So the two-party system is not quite as detrimental as you might worry about, uh, but it depends on the dynamics. If it's really racialized, it can be a problem. Well, thank you. So we have lots more questions online. Chevy Cleves, thanks for your question. He, he's asking, it's been observed that most members of the current majority in terms of the USA live segregated lives. To what degree does this inhibit momentum towards developing a shared identity versus easy adherence to mythologies that may be used to define the emerging um, majority? Thanks, Chevy. It's a huge problem. Um, and what we have seen now is that not only are we residentially segregated by race and ethnicity, but thanks to work by um, uh, Jacob Brown, who's now your colleague now, and, uh, and Ryan Enos, uh, we know that people are segregated by partisanship as well. Uh, and, and they find that partisanship is actually a greater segregator of Americans than even race is today. Um, and so it, it is hugely problematic because one of the things that, uh, one of the conclusions that comes from my work is the power of intergroup contact. Uh, and when you segregate and segment labor markets, um, you prevent people from actually crossing those boundaries and reinforce those divides. And so when we are residentially in this way, um, it really makes that all the more difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a really good observation. And it shows that even though we like to think that, you know, and this kind of goes back to Volia's point, right, about, um, you know, how different we are from these countries, the United States is pretty segregated, right? And maybe not as intentionally as it once was, um, but it is implicitly and un unintentionally segregated today. Um, which mimics what we have seen in these smaller microcosms. There's no questions. Great. So we have um, another three online. Uh, Neda Mora. So um, she's asking Has there been research on non immigration induced shifts in majority minority societies? That is from a demographic change yes. occurring within the country. Um, for example, Lebanon, where I'm from, was yes. a majority Christian Maronite in the last census in 1932. It's a great case, actually. Yes. Thank you, Neda, for bringing this. So it's another one where the census has been forbidden. very politicized <laughs> and forbidden. Um, and so she says today, Christians are, my, are min minority, while Muslims majority. History textbooks in schools end with the 1940s independence from the French mandate as there is no uh, common agreement on events since. And as you mentioned, the political elite has incentive to maintain the decisions. And I'll just add for people who aren't uh, familiar with the Lebanese context, this demographic, the, the censuses really matter because it's a consociational system. And so the distributions of power um, within the state are based on these demographics. So thank you, Nadia, for, for that question. Yeah, they're based on uh, antecedent demographics, yes. right? Because yeah. the Christians in Lebanon are reliant on their former numbers and size than their actual numbers and size today. So it's another state that fears the census effectively, or at least a, a subgroup that fears the census. Yeah, so no, it's a great question. It's not something that I study um, specifically because it's different. And the primary difference is that the minority groups, um, when you have this kind of uh, indigenous case, um, are authentically nationals, right? They are indigenous nationals. And so there's no sense of, 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 of externality or exclusion on the basis of being foreign origin, which changes the dynamics, right? Um, and usually there is also some degree of you know, franchise and equality inside the country because everyone is indigenous. Mm -hmm. So unless you have like the Bedouin or something like that in the Middle East or elsewhere, uh, second class citizens uh, or stateless people, which is pretty rare in the world, Today, um, you don't have those dynamics. Um, so it changes the dynamics when it's fertility rates and emigration departures that are changing these countries' uh, demographics. And so um, it, it is, I think, an apples and oranges situation. And, 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 and I have been asked this question before, Neda, and uh, you'll be happy to hear that actually the, the, the first country I mentioned is, is Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's, the, it's the primest example. Wonderful, thank you. So we actually have a couple of questions from Anna Hardman, who is on the steering committee for the Inter University Committee for International Migration. And so thank you, Anna, for, for tuning in um, online. And she, she asked, um, why do you reject the model of the US extended broader 
and broader definition of whiteness? Is that not what you seek to the redefinition of American to include successively broader groups? So that's the first part. And then she has an addition. Um, you mentioned in passing the fact that the UK now has a prime minister and Scotland a head of state, one with Indian origin, another with Pakistani origin, and the in group out group arbitrariness. This was also apparent in the, um, in the US. Was it relevant that Obama was half black but half African, not African American? Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so for the first question, um, why do I reject the expansion of whiteness? Um, because I saw how little work it did. Um, ultimately, there are scholars who, who have, um, I don't want to say praised it, but have certainly um, thought that there is a, a, a success associated with the expansion of whiteness to include Italians, Jews, Slavs, Greeks, et cetera, Germans. Um, who previously would have been excluded. Um, you know, the person whose work I cite a lot on this is Richard Alba, and Richard and I are friends, and, and, and we friendly, in a friendly manner, disagree uh, about this, because I, I, I think that it is um, normatively problematic um, what happened, because when you expanded whiteness, it brought in these white ethnic groups, but ultimately the line was drawn elsewhere, and that line maintained the subjugation of African Americans and, uh, and, and Asian people um, for another century thereafter. And you know, we, you might say, okay, but it's incremental. And my point would be, why wait? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and why should a nation's identity, one that is so historically diverse as our own, um, be contingent on racial identity? Uh, one that is inherently constructed and moves, movable. Um, it's, it's, it, we don't need a racialized identity. What we need is a civic identity. Um, that is equally inclusive and exclusive. And that's why it's so hard. Uh, and this brings me to Britain, actually. So um, Tony Blair, say whatever you want about him, he was a brilliant politician. He understood where the British people were. And he understood that he, and in the process of, of being admitted to the EU and the Free Mobility Pact, um, completely threw the gates open to immigration. And he recognized that if he was going to stay in power, he had to persuade the British people that they were preserving something distinct about their country um, in the face of all this immigration. And, and you can see that he was really right because eventually Brexit took place and the whole backlash of the UK party. Um, so what he did was uh, a bit of a, a, an experiment. He created a council or a working task force on Britishness. And he appointed a professor named Bernard Crick, Sir Bernard Crick, and uh, uh, I think Bernard was like an octogenarian at that point. So he really knew what it meant to be British. Um, but the results were basically milk toast liberalism. It, it, you, read, you read what Britishness meant. It was about equality and justice, right? That's not Britishness, right? That's anything in the Western dem democratic world. Any, any country would have uh, uh, subscribed to the same understanding of themselves, of their nation. What's British is warm beer. It's <laughs> pessimism. It's bad weather. You know, like that's Britishness. And that's the national distinction of the country. And, you know, the Britishness that was created under Blair was unusable because it was so flimsy and weak. It was a thin nationalism. And our challenge as a diversifying democracy and not any diversifying democracy's challenge is to redefine the nation in a civic way that is both inclusive in that manner, but also somehow exclusive. And that's the sort of you know, trillion dollar question is how do you be both? And I think that there are ways of identifying some certain civic cultural characteristics of a country, of a place that are unique to it. And in this country, we're not short on those things. Uh, and I think it's worth having that conversation. I have my own ideas, but I think other people should express them and say, okay, well, what are we? Who are we in a way that doesn't ostracize some people, but is uniquely American? Um, I'm gonna take one more, uh, one person from uh, online and then we'll come back to this last question from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for your patience, please go. Hey, Justin, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I wanna pull a little bit more on thread from your talk and your, uh, is, is there something different about, and you sort of imply there is about societies where the, the minority groups that are growing either through immigration or demographically are more than one. Does this create opportunities for coalitions, whether that's expanded whiteness that included some but excluded others, or voting blocks? 
Do you see something systematically different between that and where the demographic shift is between only two demographic groups? 100%, Eric, it's a really good question. So in the, the, the country that in some ways most resembles our politics today is Trinidad and Tobago, right? They're paralyzed by its culture wars. And uh, they have two parties that are racialized, right? But the reason why the parties are racialized is because there are two racial groups, in fact, the way they define race, Indo-Trinidadian and Afro-Trinidadian, right? It's remarkable that the United States political parties are as racialized as they are because, you know, we are so much more diverse than Trinidad, right? And that's because fear mongers are basically grouping all non-white people together, right? As if there is actually strong solidarity between them, which we have data that shows that there isn't. Um, and as if their fates are, are somehow linked in that kind of way, so that there's white and non-white. That's exactly what a divisive politician wants you to think about American politics. And yet we have not leveraged the sheer infinite you know, uh, multitude of diversity in this country um, to disarm those politics. We've done a really poor job of it, even though we're not Trinidad and Tobago and being so bifurcated. Um, but if, just in case, uh, you know, to be more pessimistic, if you look at Mauritius, um, here you, you have... Um, Muslims and Hindu Indians separated, but you don't see the, the Muslims who are a minority group bonding together with the Afro Creoles who are Catholic. And that's because of the salience of religion in that, in that island. And so it's really about the salience of divisions and whether those matter. And that's why cross-ethnic solidarity actually would be helpful in the United States, but we don't see it. Um, and, 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 and that's why it's kind of ironic that the Republican Party has been, I think, so successful of late in sort of you know, uh, castigating um, um, non-white people as somehow threatening, especially when they're of immigrant origin. Um, more hopefully, Hawaii is a better case uh, and much more hopeful because Hawaii brought in so many people from so many places. Right? I mentioned Japan, China, uh, 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 the Philippines, but there's also Portugal, Puerto Rico, uh, a lot of people. And those folks, those uh, kindred races, eventually bonded with, with native Hawaiians and, and intermarried and, and, and produced mixed uh, um, hapa people, as they're called, um, uh, that eventually were, the understanding of Hawaiianess was extended to them. And they bonded together in, in opposition to American assimilationist policies. Um, so having a sort of threat there was really helpful. Um, now we don't have that luxury, I suppose, luxury yeah. uh, in the United States contemporarily, um, but we did see that happen in a much more um, multiplicity, you know, a subject, a society subject to more multiplicity. Wonderful. So we have one last question from online, um, uh, from anonymous attendee. Um, in the way that you talk about the expansion of whiteness in the U.S. context to normalize the way of being American, can you share your thoughts about the expansion of anti-blackness, um, a meaning that is not only about black people or a specific racial group, but any group or identity that is considered to be the anti antithesis of what it means to be American in the current environment. Um, this anti-Blackness intensified with the Black Lives Matter movement, which was a global response to an institutional ideology. Yeah, look, it could, but I, unfortunately, I don't think it does. And that's because I don't think that conventionally Americans perceive anti-Blackness as being anti-other. I think they see it as, as group specific to African-Americans specifically. Uh, and in some cases, you might say for good reason. Um, but and this is actually relates to that what I was saying earlier, my observations about cross ethnic solidarity in the United States. Right? We just don't see it. Uh, I undertook some survey work recently that I have not yet published, but it's in, in a Time Art Magazine article um, with Ipsos, uh, one of the major pollsters, and we we leverage a conjoint design, and it finds that people are are very unlikely, if, even among minority groups to co-identify with other members of minority groups, um, with not the same minority, but of other minority groups. So we don't see any kind of strong bonds between Black people and Asians, for instance, and that's, by the way, vice versa, um, between Latinos and Black people, between Latinos and Asians. We don't see these bonds. Um, quite the opposite, actually. Asians are more likely to find more in common with white Americans than they are other minorities. So we're not seeing these kinds of co-ethnic bonds across different minority groups. And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, uh, which will mean that the, the anti-Blackness will continue to not be so solidaristic in nature and will be more group specific. Thank you. Um, if there isn't uh, another question from the audience, I think I'll take the frog because we have a couple more minutes. Um, 
So actually, my question is about these case studies and, and um, you know, leveraging. Uh, one thing you mentioned, there's variation in who comes, there's variation who counts, right? And then, but we see political backlash. And I'm wondering whether um, you see variation, like the way that states vary over who counts, changes levels of backlash because mm -hmm. i'm really struck by you know the cases i know the best which are in the gulf like the uae 90 percent of the population is non-citizen Qatar also 90 percent bahrain 57 as you mentioned uh, kuwait i believe 63 so and uh, as an aggregate for the gcc with the gulf corporation council we're talking about 60 percent of the population is non-citizen but you don't see the same kind of anti-immigrant mobilization and rhetoric um, that we've seen in Europe, that we've seen in the US. Um, so yeah, so like, it, is it, do you feel like that's also because there's variation in who counts in, in those contexts, um, uh, citizens are more secure in knowing that these are individuals who are not going to become citizens and therefore there's less of a political backlash. So yes, does who counts um, create more variation than necessarily who comes. Yes, uh, the, the short <laughs> answer is yes, uh, until they do count, Yeah. right? And I think that's why the Bahrain case is so interesting because there was a lot of backlash when people began to realize yeah. people are coming and they're starting to count, Yeah. yeah. right? And I think that's really uh, telling, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a microcosm, I think, of exactly the dynamics that you're describing. Um, and so it is, it is not, it's not surprising. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. And, you know, what's interesting is in Singapore, um, a lot of Singaporeans will tell you that Chinese Singaporeans, many of whom, by the way, are from Peranakan backgrounds, meaning that they are sort of non-young Chinese, South Seas Chinese, whose families immigrated to uh, Southeast Asia centuries ago. Um, so they have not been in the mainland for a very long time. Um, many of those, many people will tell you that the Chinese Singaporeans are more discriminatory or feel more threatened by the arrival of PRC Chinese, mm -hmm. so recent arrivals, than they do from Malay or Indian Singaporeans, right? And I say, well, that's progress, actually, uh, on the one hand, right? Um, but maybe it also is an indication of what you were just saying is that, you know, the Chinese do not have high fertility rates in Singapore. And so they know that the state in order to maintain these demographic levels will continue to admit more Chinese. And when they admit PRC Chinese, they're often given citizenship. And so that sense of threat may come from counting mm -hmm. um, because a lot of immigrants come into the country and are not granted citizenship. There's a very large temporary labor migration program that Singapore operates. And they are not extended the rights and benefits of, of full nationality. So I do think that this is quite telling um, and uh, and I think it's actually quite related to your next book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I wonder. I, I don't know if it's at all instructive, but I think uh, I, I think these are really interesting cases in that way. Absolutely. I'll just do a quick scan, see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, I, it looks like no, and, and and we don't have any more questions online. So um, we have one question. We do. Is there any? Oops, sorry. Someone's hand was up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Jack again. Um, Jack Gordon, did you look at Sri Lanka? Language and religion are more divisive than race or ethnic groups they community, but you can't tell membership until they speak. Yeah, that's a really good point. No, I did not look at Sri Lanka because uh, much like Lebanon, uh, Sri Lanka, it's uh, it's primarily indigenous. Um, um, there's been some transit, but uh, from the from the mainland, but the subcontinent. But no, I have I, I did not one of my cases. Um, but uh, there is a lot of good work actually on ethnic politics in Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm sure, um, uh, and a lot of it actually is in the sort of realm of people who study um, concepts of majoritarianism or concepts of a majority and a majority identity uh, in places like that, where you have multiple indigenous groups that are ethnically or religiously different. Yeah, so another question from the audience. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, you know, I'm kind of following up on this question about the change in identification of who is white in the US historically. And I absolutely hear you and I agree with you that that was a very exclusive whiteness. So even though some Eastern Europeans apparently on the street were white, it was not something to be proud of, right? But I think the interesting thing that, uh, you know, at least my understanding of the historical context based on uh, research by uh, Marco Bellini, Vicky Fuca, and, and others, 
is that this identification came from uh, oftentimes migration of uh, African Americans to the north. Yeah. And so, in a way, demographic change uh, and a different form of actually economic threat prompted the change in identification among the whites, <clears throat> the emergence of this shared identity. And so, I'm curious, you know, if somehow increasing immigration by creating a new threat might facilitate the change in identity and the creation of superordinate identity among people who are already in the US or from other countries there. But the dynamic, this dynamic ends up being not as simple as just, you know, someone unites against someone else, but change in the graphics leads to shifting boundaries. Absolutely. And actually the, the sort of smoking gun for this is some letters that Teddy Roosevelt wrote to a um, pretty eugenicist, a eugenicist uh, social theorist from uh, a demographer from Australia at the time uh, in, his, in his contemporary, um, where Roosevelt uh, feared the loss of white supremacy in the United States, um, but from the cradle is what he called it. And, um, and so he was basically arguing for a more civic understanding of, of, of the American identity in order to stave off um, that demographic threat. So yeah, I think that that work is really important and it is informative actually. Uh, uh, but the problem of course is equally, you know, the normative question would be, is that any better, right? It's just, you just need to create a new, uh, a new boogeyman, a new outgroup, right? Uh, do, we, do we need to be able to exclude someone internally in order to create that superordinate identity? Because it's not that super when it's not actually applied more broadly. And, and this is kind of what I'm arguing is that, you know, applauding the um, uh, adjacency of white Latinos or um, half white mixed race people um, is, is, is a marginal gain and a societal loss. Um, it, it, it only postpones what we ultimately must do and that is to create that superordinate identity. And so, um, you know, I, I think that associating what it means to be an American with whiteness um, is precisely the mistake that we cannot, cannot repeat. Uh, that actually connects to Heidi's uh, Brooks question. So Heidi asks, um, one group of mixed race and ethnicity is the Afro-Latino population. What are your thoughts on the opportunity for cross-group solidarity? And then she has a follow-up that's, um, I'm also very intrigued by the fact that other countries like Vietnam and China have significant minorities, approximately 15%, but they have a more homogenous reputation. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that is that is true. No, I don't have anything like profound to say about that, but it is true. I mean, there, that, that, that exists. And the status of those minorities is really interesting, actually, mm -hmm. um, depending also if they're visible minorities or not. Yeah. Um, that matters, too. You know, sometimes when you have a religious minority uh, or a co-ethnic group, you can't tell, mm -hmm. uh, at least until people open their mouths, as, as, as Jack said earlier. Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, no, but to the to the first uh, to the first point, um, uh, about Afro-Latinos. So yeah, that is interesting actually, um, but there's not very many Afro-Latinos. Um, and uh, there's a lot of anti-Blackness inside of the Latino population as well. Um, but setting that aside for a second, um, or those constraints aside, in that same study that I mentioned earlier with Ipsos, we, we do find that um, Afro-Latinos uh, who are polled do actually have co-identity with other minorities in a way that you don't see. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, their size is a constraining factor because it's 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 just not enough. Probably. Within the U.S. Context, within the because, U.S. Uh, within Latin America, there's a huge yeah. gap. Right, but of course, in Latin America, you also don't see these solidarities because there's so much racism and prejudice against uh, Afro Latinos in their countries of origin, right? Uh, and against mestizos in some cases too, right? Uh, or, or indigenous populations. Um, in fact, in some ways, actually, Latin America is a fascinating um, uh, and really, I think, severely understudied. Um, realm of racial politics, um, because here in, in, in the North, um, we tend to, you know, broad brush uh, everyone as Latino, but in the Latin American world, it's just so far from the case, and um, the racialization of both poverty and power uh, is, is really, really deep. Um, all right, well, unless there's a, any last questions from the audience members, I want to thank um, you for attending. Thank everyone on Zoom, and especially thank our speaker, Justin, for this. Uh, so much. Um, this is the last event for this semester, but um, please, if you haven't signed up for our listserv, do so. Um, Sabina just uh, linked it in the Zoom, and we'll be starting um, 
with a new speaker series next uh, fall. So thank you so much for making the time and see you at the next one. Thank you.